Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Feldner. I am the Dean of the Dietrich College of Communication, and I have the distinct um, privilege of being the one who gets to welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you who haven't been on a Teams lecture in a while, welcome back to the Teams world for our uh, 2022 uh, Burley lecture, Media Ethics lecture. Here in the college, we recognize that a lot of important work happens in the classrooms where students are um, refining their craft and learning the skills, but we also know it's much more complex than that, that the if only issues were always so straightforward, but there are questions and twists and turns, and we get there by um, really staying in touch with the profession and welcoming in professionals who help us really think through those questions. And so it is always uh, really great to have these moments. And for this Burley lecture, it's a special one in that um, we are able to bring award-winning journalists who have been working in the field doing social justice reporting. And it's a partnership with the O'Brien Fellowship in Public Service Journalism that happens here in the college. The annual Burley Media Lecture uh, annual, it's, it's a talk we have every year that focuses on something topical and the moral issues that focus that we all focus today. It is sponsored by our college, but it honors William R. Burley, a 1957 Marquette journalism graduate. He started working for the in Evansville, Indiana, and working for their newspaper at age 14. Grab on to that, students, age 14 as a sports reporter. And then he retired after a long, successful career in 2000 as president and CEO of the EW Scripps Company, having led the transform transformation of Scripps from a primarily newspaper enterprise into a media company with interest in cable and broadcast TV. Newspaper, e-commerce, interactive media, licensing and syndication. Burley is named, Burley's name is given to this because he uh, always was interested in the ethical issues that that our communicators report on and the way they work and the decisions they make as they do their work. So we are really glad to be here today. And I'm also really grateful of the best way to engage these conversations is start with our students who are in the midst of grappling with these issues on a daily basis. So we have two student moderators today and I'm gonna hand it off to them. The first is Skylar Chun. She's the investigative editor for the Marquette Wire, which if you're not with um, on campus, it is our um, student media organization. She also has served as a program intern for the O'Brien Fellowship. She's a senior majoring in journalism, international affairs, and has a minor in digital media. She's joined by Hannah Hernandez. She is the assistant news editor for the Marquette Wire. She also is doing an internship with the O'Brien Fellowship. She is a senior and she's a journalism major, but also with an English and Spanish um, programs added to that. So I'm really grateful to have them leading our conversation and I will hand it off to them. And again, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dean Feldner, and thank you everyone for being here today. Amerba Knight is a high impact reporter, producer, and podcaster in Nashville, Tennessee, um, where you can hear her on Nashville Public Radio, especially on stories regarding race and inequality. Her reporting on the juvenile justice system in Rutherford County, Tennessee, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and other major awards. She is the creator of the Peabody Award winning podcast. The Promise About Inequality and the People Trying to Rise Above It. She is working on a major podcast series based on the journalism we're discussing today, and she is currently a fellow in ProPublica's Local Reporting Network. And the second reporter we have is Ken Armstrong. Ken is a reporter at ProPublica, which is the nonprofit investigative news organization. He is a multiple Pulitzer Prize winner over the course of a career that included years at the Chicago Tribune, the Seattle Times, and the Marshall Project. With ProPublica's T. Christian Miller, he co-reported the story of a woman charged with lying about being raped, a story that became This American Life episode, a book, and an eight-part Netflix series titled Unbelievable. In Chicago, his reporting with Steve Mills helped prompt the Illinois governor to suspend executions and empty death row. Now we're gonna turn it over to Ken and Merva. We've asked them to tell us about what their story found, what obstacles they overcame, what impact the story had, and ethical issues in the story or the reporting. So you'll hear from them now. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. It's such an honor to be here, especially with Ken, um, who, as you can see, is far more credentialed than I am. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I'll just start by saying um, a little bit about how this story came to be. 
Um, I am, as they said, a reporter here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I moved here in 2016. And just a month after I moved here from Chicago, uh, I read about the arrests at Hopgood Elementary um, and the arrest of, of 11 children uh, in Rutherford County. And um, it was hard not to read that story and think uh, and not have many questions about it. And as a reporter, you know, half of uh, half of the way you get stories is asking questions and having an instinct about something. And it always was um, it was always a story that I I was really uh, flummoxed by and and had so many questions about. But uh, it wasn't on my beat initially when I first got here. Uh, I was really covering like the metro kind of city limits. And this was outside of that. Um, but I just kept tabs on it. And I started doing bigger, longer stories. Um, I started my podcast. And, um, and I kept circling back to this story because what I had been doing was just kind of keeping tabs on it. Um, I did find a bit of time to cover um, some of it, which is where I really got interested because what happened was all these lawsuits started getting filed. And so I started to follow the breadcrumbs of those lawsuits. And eventually I did cover in 2017, very briefly, just a daily story about the injunction that ended uh, the illegal jailing of the kids and the policy that led to that. So upon that, I, I met the lawyers. Um, I started to just piece everything together that really um, was a bit hard to figure out if you weren't combing through all the lawsuits and keeping tabs on it, which was that the Hobgood arrests and this big lawsuit and the lawsuits, and many of the lawsuits around this county kind of stemmed from that arrest. So I immediately saw, you know, a narrative. I saw a through line. I saw a, a flashpoint and then everything that came afterwards, you know, the fallout from it and what it, um, what it led to the discovery of. And so really I just, um, and you know, it's, it's really nice to be able to find uh, Some place that's mired in a bunch of federal lawsuits because there's a lot of stuff that's on the record, um, and you can start, you know, poking around Pacer and and reading complaints and reading, you know, um, the you know all of the filings that go along with a, a big federal lawsuit. And so that's what I started doing essentially with uh, seven different lawsuits and this kind of spaghetti soup. And and I um, I finally came to a point where I was ready to do a new story. Um, my stories are very slow, they take years. And so you might have one in your back pocket for a while and then eventually you can kind of come to it. And that's what happened. It was really the pandemic and it was, I'm used to doing immersive reporting, spending a lot of time with people and places. And I really had to find a story that was gonna work um, for a time, an unprecedented time in reporting where we couldn't just go be with people and places. And so I, I really said, you know what, this, this, is, this is telling me that I need to come back to this story um, because there's so much of a paper trail. There's so many documents. There's so much to spend time in, hopefully until the world kind of opens up a little bit more and I can really launch into um, the more, you know, kind of shoe leather reporting of it. And so um, the opportunity came about that, um, ProPublica was doing another round of the local reporting network grants. And so I applied with this. Um, I got one and I was happily paired with Ken Armstrong as my buddy, uh, which is a really great part of the local reporting network. If anyone is interested in it, happy to talk more about it. But one of the best parts of it is that they pair everybody with a veteran reporter at ProPublica who can just kind of be um, a shoulder to lean on, you know, somebody who's not your editor someone that you can ask questions to. And I had always admired Ken's work from my time in Chicago. And um, I, I was always doing stories. And when I would do clip searches, I would inevitably find Ken's clips because he'd always done everything before I got there. And, um, and he was just so excited about this story. And I have to say, there were other people that were excited about it, but Ken, Ken got it in a way that a lot of other people didn't and um it's a really complicated story but uh ken saw exactly you know what it was which was a narrative story a story that could be 
um, really a gem of like a recreated, uh, like a recreation with all of the things that we had access to and that we would gain access to. And he was just like, he was just an amazing kind of booster. And he asked um, uh, uh, midway through whether he might come on and be a co-reporter. And I was incredibly excited about that, A, just to get the opportunity to work with someone like Ken, but also the story is really massive <laughs> and there's just so much, there's so much. So it worked out so perfectly that Ken came on board and we have these two different, you know, we're in two different locations, but because this story has such a robust records and paper trail, like we were able to, he was able to do so much work from Seattle and never have to come to Tennessee. And so it was just this wonderful combination of these skill sets that we combined and we were able to, you know, really come together, but also bite off different chunks and, it was just really wonderful. So in a nutshell, I came to it the way you do with a lot of stories, which is that you get something kind of stuck in your craw and you have a lot of questions and they never go away. And then you just kind of have to scratch the itch and figure out there's like a lot more there. So, um, so yeah, so that's, uh, I can, you know, Ken can chime in. <laughs> He's got, uh, I know uh, a lot of stuff that he could bring to this. Um, but, uh, but Ken, is there anything you want to add before I get to like kind of what we found? Uh, no, uh, just that, you know, this is something that you and I have talked about before. I was just so grateful that you allowed me to take part in this. I mean, that's one of the toughest things for reporters to do is to ask to be involved in a story that somebody <laughs> else has has found and cultivated and developed because you're really worried about being presumptuous or or, or something. And Maribah could not have been more gracious. And, um, and it really worked out beautifully because Maribah understands radio and audio in a way that I simply do not. And that wound up playing a profound part in the reporting on the print piece. And of course it will in the, in the podcast uh, series to come as well. And I, I'll be happy to talk about that more later in terms of how audio contributed to this. But yeah, so so Ken hit on something, which is that like I bring a radio approach, which is really immersive interviews. It's interviews that are very different from the print style, which is a bit of like a kind of you have a list of questions, you want to get the answers to those questions. And it's kind of like a boom, 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 boom. With radio, the way I do interviews is much more of like, I want to find out, I want, I need an arc. I need the arc of the person that I'm talking to. Um, I need to have kind of these moments with them where kind of sparks will fly, where I will get to the heart of something or have a really intimate moment with somebody. And and that actually played in so well to this story because what we were trying to do was, first of all, reconstruct some pretty vivid scenes and then take it into the now and uh, think about and talk to people about um you know, what this had done to them, um, how, you know, we could kind of cast it forward from kind of, you know, this incident in 2016 and then figure out um, what had happened in the interim and where people were at now and what was, um, you know, what was still still missing, you know, what still wasn't, wasn't there. Um, you know, what was exciting about this too from an accountability angle was the fact that it was clean in so far as that there were two people that were chiefly responsible for what had been happening and they were still in positions of power. They were still, it was still the judge and she was on the bench and still the jailer and she was still running the detention center. So obviously that's something that if you're looking for a story uh, that's an accountability story that you have kind of these direct um you know, what's the minimum and the maximum of the story? Well, um, the maximum would be that you've got two people that could potentially lose their jobs or like, you know, not that you go into it thinking that, but that there are people that are still doing what they did then now, despite all of the stuff that's happened. So that was also really appealing. Um, and what we found over the course of our reporting was really, um, that, you know, piecing together all these lawsuits had their own findings, um, which was, you know, things like that there had been this illegal policy that were called the filter system that was um, 
jailing kids at like an astronomical rate. Um, you know, that the judge had been responsible for um, making a policy that caused any kid to be arrested, to be sent to the jail. And by the way, there was no other option for a kid except to be arrested. There was no kind of citation or summons. It was, if you are in trouble as a juvenile in Rutherford County and you get a petition taken out, you're going to go to jail. Um, whether you'll stay there is another matter, but you will go there for a while and either you will be processed out or processed in. And so just figuring out the intricacies of this system, how it was built over time, how it was not questioned, how the county funded it, how the state missed it. Like we could see through the lawsuits, like what the big problems were, but what we did with our reporting was pull it out and say like, why did that happen? What are, you know, what were the steps um, that, the, what would, what are the statements, you know, what did the local, um, what did the county commissioners miss? Like what, did, so we were able to kind of take it further and then also really figure out um, these, uh, th this kind of, I mean, one of the things that I was most interested in is understanding how a system really functions. You know, we talk so much about systems right now and that systems are the problem and not people. And yeah, there are systems that are oppressive. There are systems that are terrible, but systems are made up of people and they're made up of decisions and they're made up of policies. And we really wanted to like untangle all of that and create this kind of anatomy of a system. And I was so, so happy and proud to be able to do that. Um, and, um, and, you know, we found a lot more stuff than we ever thought we would. Um, I mean, one really good example is, uh, you know, the opening of the story is completely reconstructed. Um, and it's so vivid. And, um, you know, I really credit Ken with figuring out how to put all of our stuff together and make it so vivid. Um, but what we had to start with in our reporting was a 140 some odd page report that was done by the uh, Murfreesboro Police and the Metro Nashville Police in an investigation. So after the big arrest happened, they said, we got to figure out why this happened and we got to do an investigation, and then we'll publish our findings. Like 10 months later, they did, and we read those. And um, yeah, there was some stuff in it. You know, there's interviews with all the different players. And, uh, but what it had on it too, on like the first or second page was like a little note that said, you know, these are, uh, this report is based off of audio interviews with, and it had 20 different names. And as an audio reporter, I immediately think, where is that audio? I love that audio. And so Ken was really great about pushing me to say, yeah, like, let's get the audio. And so we got that through public records requests. And it ended up being 38 hours of audio of all of these people um, talking about this moment. And so we listened to all of that audio. And what we were able to do was really recreate this scene to such an intimate and detailed degree it felt like you were there. So that was something we were really excited and surprised by. Um, you don't always have the audio available um, with things. And, and when you do, it's always worth getting. And that's where Ken is so great because Ken's not an audio person, but he still knew he wanted to listen to it. <laughs> you know, he's been around enough to know like there's something there. Um, and so, yeah. So, uh, I mean, there, th we found things about the state and their lack of oversight. We found stuff about, I, I watched 140, 137, uh, you know, meetings with county commissioners uh, over 12 years to see kind of how do they talk about this place and what questions do they ask? And like that revealed its own thing. So we had all these kind of like tracks of reporting. And then when you put it all together, you know, that's the story. Um, and yeah, I don't know, Ken, what, what did you find surprising? I, I feel like I'm kind of been stewed in it for so long. I don't know what, I don't know if anything was surprising other than like the things that we found that I felt were, were more than I ever thought we could get. But uh, yeah, I, I felt like where we were really fortunate is that there were some key people who didn't agree to be interviewed, but we were able to still hear their voices and hear their perspectives in other ways. You know, Mariba mentioned how she watched 137 public safety meetings. 
These are meetings during which the jailer would speak to county commissioners. Um, that's wonderful. What an opportunity to see her talking, you know, in, in this particular setting. And we learned so much from that. The downside is you have to watch 137 meetings. And I imagine all of you have watched some public meetings to know just how incredibly dull they can be, right? You're, you're watching 137 meetings and you wind up using four sentences from it, but they're, but they're four good sentences and you need them. Um, the same thing with the judge. The judge declined to be interviewed with us, but she had a radio show. What are the odds of that? So we had 60 hours of tape of her talking about her work as a juvenile judge. That was invaluable to us. The downside is it's a really dull radio show. And I listened to it and it was always introduced with this awful Moody Blues song. And I had that Moody Blues song <laughs> in my head on, on a loop for <laughs> months. I can't tell you how much I hate that song now. Um, but it was invaluable getting to hear her talk about her work in that way. And then the hours of interviews where we had police being interviewed about where they went wrong in their investigation, that was incredible. And, and when you, we got some perspectives that you rarely hear where you had police officers questioning the work of other police officers and of their superiors and talking about their frustration at seeing something that is absolutely wrong, that's fundamentally unjust and not being able to get anybody on the chain of command to listen to them and to call it off. It's rare to get that perspective. And I think Maribu and I knew when we were listening to that, that that really was the opening scene, right? That when you have these officers in that assistant principal's office and this one officer in particular is absolutely keenly aware of how unfair this is, how wrong it is, and yet he can't get it called off. Um, so that was, that was wonderful. And I think that's one of those things where when we have partnerships, that really works well because Maribu thinks audio first and a lot of print people, this is changing, but traditionally we're, we're document centric. You know, we're always filing records requests for words on paper. And, and now, you know, I always ask for audio and video as well, but it took, I had to climb a line, learning curve to get to that point, to, to recognize that often the audio and the video is so much more powerful than the words on paper, you know, because it's coming directly from the source. So that, that was a, a wonderful surprise. And in terms of the obstacles, one of the biggest obstacles we had to deal with was that we were writing about juvenile court. You know, these records are confidential for good reasons. You know, they, they, they don't want children to have to carry this around with them for the rest of their lives. They don't want a permanent record that is going to make it difficult for them you know, to succeed as, as adults. You have very few appellate records because of the way the juvenile justice system works. But Maribu and I dealt with that largely just through brute force. We filed so many public records requests and were able to fill in holes about with, with data gaps, with racial disparities, uh, we, we kept finding ways to get what we needed, even if the records weren't available to us from juvenile court. And, and in that respect, we had the luxury of time. You know, that, that, that's one of the things that it's often forgotten. We had a long time to work on this story and we needed it. If we, if we didn't have all of that time, I don't think the story would have answered as many questions as it ultimately did. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, coming out of like the fact that it's juvenile court and that poses all of these challenges, um, you know, the, another question you guys had was kind of the moral test. Um, you know, the fact that this was about kids is difficult, but the fact that, I, on the other hand, the fact that so much of it is already um, kind of uh, withheld from us. For example, like we didn't have to make many decisions in the story about whether to use a name. We knew right away if it was a minor, we're not going to use the name. But also in the lawsuits, they used um, most of the time initials. So we felt like, well, that's a public record. That's perfect. That gives us a roadmap for how we want to use this. We'll use initials. Um, 
We did ask uh, individuals like Quintarius Frazier and Jacorius Brinkley about using their names because they are now adults. And, um, and that was not a difficult conversation. It was just a frank conversation that I had to ask very clearly as to how would you like to be identified in this? Um, I think it would be helpful if we can use your full name, but I also understand that you might not want to do that. Um, and they both were fine with it. Um, I think because they know what was done to them was really wrong. And that um, if we can't put a face and a name to it, then it does sometimes lessen the impact. You know, it does allow people to just kind of not see somebody as a person. Um, so we wanted to be able to be as specific as possible, but we had enough rules of the road and we had enough kind of um, of a roadmap uh, with the court documents and such um, that it, we never faced anything like really big conundrum. Um, but, but yeah, but it is always tough when you're writing about kids. Um, you do have to be mindful, but um, because of our limitations, we didn't have a lot of stuff that we were like, oh, should we use that or should we not use that? It's like, we have something. <laughs> Like, surely we're going to use it. So, um, so yeah. Um, but, you know, I think that kind of concludes kind of what we want to say about this. I'm really excited to answer questions. Um, and I would just say fire away. But thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. I really um, thought it was amazing how you guys use audio and video to really recreate the scene of what happened and really give readers an insight into that. So that was really good. So as you said, now we're going to go into the Q&A portion of the discussion. Um, the questions we have are from students in the intro journalism course taught by Dr. Anna Garner. And so to both of you guys, this question is from Jack, Tate, Kaylin, and Haley, and they ask, leaders of the justice system declined to be interviewed. How did that impact the story? And how do you work around those no comments and still make the story complete? Yeah, well, I think Ken put it well that like we 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 dove in. <laughs> yeah, we, we had them speaking to other people. So instead of having them being interviewed by us, we had them answering questions from other people in other settings, not only on the radio and not only to a, a government board, but in depositions. Um, both the, the judge and the head of the detention center were deposed. And we had not only transcripts, but we had video. They, those were videotaped. So we were able to draw on that. And typically what you try to do in instances like that is a lot of times you're able to interview somebody without interviewing them, um, which sounds ridiculous, but you're able to basically see if they've answered the questions you want to pose in other forms. And you gather that as much as you can, and you try to be as fair to them as you can. If they have answered difficult questions in these other forms, you try to give them their best defense, their best version of why they did what they did in the story. You're always grateful for that when you're able to draw on that um, because it's it's not unusual to have the key people you're writing about decline to be interviewed. So a lot of times you just go in knowing you're gonna to try to gather every bit of information you can, try to be as fair to them as you can and, and act as though you know, you were able to interview them through these other means. I always tell Ken that he needs to teach a class called interviewing without interviewing um, because he is so good at finding everything that this person, like every word somebody has uttered, <laughs> whether it's searching through tons of clips to see, you know, I mean, when he kind of one of the tracks that he went off on was doing really comprehensive clip searching and backgrounding um, while I did some other records work. And what he would do was like just scour newspapers.com and find every single article about the people, every Q and A, every little like profile, everything. And then he would go into Pacer and he would look for, you know, we would look for other lawsuits where they were maybe deposed, even if it doesn't have to do with our story, 
could they have been spoken to or questioned in any other form? And then it's like, just, you just call all of that and you like put it all together. And so we really did get a sense. I mean, even for example, Lynn Duke, like I did a deep dive about her and found that she had a pension for writing letters to the editor, to the local newspaper about things like, you know, waiting in line at the DMV and how there's not enough seats for senior citizens or, you know, the fact that, like, watch out if you get a magazine subscription for your teen for Christmas because there is some not-so-savory things in, like, the back of it that they should be, you know. Like, she just, I mean, it's really kind of fun because you're just doing, you're being an investigator and you're trying to find every single clue and every single crumb that um, is out there about that person. And then when you do such a comprehensive look, you can pull it all together and you can really get a sense for patterns of speech or the things they say over and over again, or, you know, so, um, th yeah, it was really cool watching Ken do that. Yeah, and we were able, you know, we, we asked for, uh, personnel files for them. So <laughs> any, any public job they ever had, you know, we, we were asking for personnel files. We got emails, we got job evaluations within the personnel files. We found unexpected things like greeting cards, you know, that they had written or received. Um, so you got to feel for them personally, you know, not just professionally. And that really helped. And then we would find emails that they had written between, you know, one to the other. So and the nice thing about those two is it, instead of it being an interview with a journalist interviewing a, a subject of a story, they're scenes and, and they're people mm -hmm. acting in a more informal way. Um, and a lot of times the scenes are more telling than interviews with journalists uh, in, in, in my uh, experience. People are more themselves um, when they're talking to somebody who's not a journalist with a notebook or a recorder. Yeah, thank you. I like that you both kind of touched on like fairness um, and giving everyone like an equal chance to share their side of the story. Um, this next question is from Erin F. Miranda, Emma and Tiana, and they kind of ask a question relating to like being objective in your storytelling. Um, so like in covering such a distressing issue, was it difficult to remove personal emotion and bias um, from your writing and remain objective, even though there were clearly people at fault um, in the situation? And how do you kind of cope emotionally and uphold um, neutrality? Okay, I guess I'll take that first. Um, uh, I mean, it's hard. It's hard. Like I'm a parent now I have a four almost four year old and I do feel like part of what drives me to do reporting on young people which I think really it's funny when I look back like most of my reporting has centered somehow on young people um when I became a parent it really was a game changer for me so um so, you know, I don't want to pretend like I can't, I, I'm far away from everything. I'm not. Like, it's really hard to hear these stories. It's hard to read these stories. I, I try to, like, harness that and use that um, to just dig deeper and go further and to try to um, find what I need to show my anger and my frustration. Um, but also, you know, being really mindful that like if I want people's hearts and minds to be changed I have to be a I have to shoot straight you know I've got to give everybody a fair shake like it's it's there's no other way for me to communicate my work and to have an impact if I don't do it right and Ob as objectively as possible and give everybody the chance to say what they want to say and to defend themselves because otherwise it's just going to burn hot and it's going to burn fast, you know, and it's not, it's not going to have the impact that you want it to have. So I really treat it as kind of just like a part of the discipline of saying like, if I am angry about something, I'm angry about it for a reason and use that to kind of fuel my reporting and then also that um, if I really want to not just preach to the choir or if I really want to be a thorough journalist, that you give everybody a fair shot because everybody's human and everybody does make mistakes. And, you know, maybe there are sometimes there are clear villains, but 
I don't believe anybody is 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 really truly throughout through and through a villain. Um, I think people are more complicated than that, and I like that. That's why I like doing this work. Is I lean into that complexity. So, um, and then also I just try to take walks, um, uh, drink wine, um, have time with my friends. You know, <laughs> the usual stuff to stay sane. I, I tend to think, you know, my, my goals are to be accurate, fair, and thorough. You know, th those are really the signposts. I don't think in terms of objectivity or neutrality, because I think those are often misconstrued. And I think uh, a lot of people in the public think of being objective as being dispassionate, you know, not really, you know, caring about the subject in a way. And I only want to write about stories that I care about, because if I don't care about it, readers aren't going to care about it. So for me, I, I really, and there's, there've been some really good books and essays written over the years about how objectivity has been twisted over time. Um, and it, it, it that, that's why I, I, I kind of replaced it. I, I, I just think my goal is to be accurate, fair, and thorough. And if I've hit those three markers, then um, I'm satisfied. And so now we're going to move into um, career questions. And um, one question from Mimi, she asked, was specifically for Ken, um, was there a specific news story or event that sparked your love from, for journalism? And why did you gravitate toward this career? You know, I, I gravitated towards the career. Mirab has heard me talk about this before because I was dropping out of everything else. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I went to law school only to discover that I had no interest in being a lawyer. So I dropped out and then I went into the Peace Corps where they assigned me to be an agricultural extension agent in the Sahara Desert. And I can't even grow a tomato plant in my backyard in Seattle. So I was a miserable misfit for that. I dropped out of that and I was in my mid twenties and I was trying to think, what is it that I've done in my life that I really enjoyed? And the answer was I enjoyed working at my college paper. And so for me, it's what I decided to pursue. And at that time, this was a long time ago, this was in the 1980s, you didn't need a journalism degree because I didn't have one. You, you, could, you could forge a career in journalism without a degree and with minimal experience. And I don't know that that is as much the case now, unfortunately. Um, but for me, that opportunity was available and that's what I decided to do. Uh, the other thing, the other reason it appealed to me, and I'm not alone in this, is I tend to be very shy. Um, I get very uncomfortable in a lot of social uh, settings. And journalism was a way for me to not be isolated, where by virtue of the work that I'm doing, I'm out meeting people, I'm traveling, I'm outside of my comfort zone, but it's in a structured way where I'm, I, I, I really enjoy it. And I've met a lot of journalists who are also shy and kind of fell into this line of work for similar reasons, where it got them out of their house or out of their apartment, right? Out of their head um, and got them out dealing with people, interesting people, interesting stories. And for me, it's it's really been, been good in that way. Um, and in terms of any particular story, I did a story at a small paper in Idaho on these two veterinarians who were accusing each other of all kinds of awful things. They were competing against each other in terms of their, their practices, and they were accusing each other of killing their animals, of, of sabotaging their businesses, vandalizing their trucks, their lines of work. And it was the, I was a young reporter. I didn't really know what I was doing. I went to the sheriff's office and they had two stacks of records. One was one veterinarian accusing the other veterinarian of all kinds of awful things. The other pile was the other veterinarian accusing that veterinarian of all kinds of awful things. And it was the first time I discovered that there was this whole world of documents available to us as reporters that you just had to learn how to ask for them and you had to learn what the rules were. You know, what are the exemptions? What's the public records law? And for me, that's where my infatuation with public documents began. And uh, I think a lot of reporters have similar stories like that. The first time they see a file where they're just blown away 
by what's available to them if they know how to ask for it. Thank you. Um, and this next question is for Maribel, um, um from Ryan and Unistri and Brianna. Um, how did your interest in racial justice and studying African American studies um, change your perspective on racial injustice in America? And why did you choose to focus on my marginalized communities? That's a great question. Thank you so much for asking that, folks. Um, so I also, like Ken, didn't know I wanted to do journalism, but I have always been interested in stories and I've always been interested in tough, tough issues. And I grew up in a very progressive um, and integrated uh, environment. I can come from Cambridge, Massachusetts, which back in the 80s was different than it is now. Um, and I went to public school and like my elementary school was, um, uh, it was bilingual, it was Creole and English because we had such a large Haitian population in Cambridge. Um, so I was really kind of, I always grew up um, kind of, and I'm very thankful, like being kind of a, aware of myself and how I was different and how my friends didn't look like me or I didn't look like them or when I went over to their houses, they ate different food or, you know, I, and, and I don't know, that was just kind of baked into me. And um and then I went to college, I went to NYU, and um, I met all of these other amazing people from all over the country who did not have the same experience as me, um, who um, were really truly kind of had felt that marginalization. And maybe I just couldn't hear it when I was younger um, because surely I didn't live in that kind of utopia. I mean, that just doesn't exist. But, um, but I think maybe I was like ready to understand it and try to grapple with it. And so I very quickly, um, I took a course on uh, uh, U.S. history, but I took African American U.S. history. So I just like relearned. So it was like doing AP American history all over again, but from the perspective of Black Americans, and it was like just a game changer for me. It was just like, a, oh my gosh, like this, it rocked my world, and it really just set me on this path of inquiry and trying to understand like how did we get here what are the stories and 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 i also just love stories so much like i i majored in african american studies and african diaspora studies in part because i was so interested in oral histories which is obviously a big part of the african tradition um and so how does that fit in i mean this is a big question i'm gonna raise here um when i got out of college i just i just had so many more questions and i just had so many different places that I wanted to be and understand. And one thing that my college experience set me up to do, I think, was that um, you had to do the work. You had to do the reading. You had to understand the history. Um, and as a white person in America, you had to understand history in a really, really important way in how you are privileged by it and how others are not. And, um, and I think that my whole college career kind of prepped me in a way um, that I don't think just like being a reporter could do, like it forced me to intellectualize stuff and to like separate myself and to be actually in many of my classes, one of the few white people. And so, um, just really important for me as a person, as an individual, as an American to go through. And so when I just, when I started telling stories, I just kind of launched into those stories. I still had so many more questions, but I felt like I had a pretty good foundation, um, but I, I just, I, I needed to know more. And so the other thing I love about reporting is that it's a passport. You can go anywhere, you can talk to anyone. And, um, and I just found myself wanting to understand um, parts of our community and our country and people that we have, really left behind. Um, and I have a lot of issues with this kind of being a voice for the voiceless. I'm not that. I don't want to be that. I don't think that's the right way to frame anything. I think people are talking and we're not listening. So how can we tell stories where we are listening? And now as I've grown as a reporter, I think about how can I tell stories where I'm not just trying to build empathy and embody 
um, another experience, but how can I also tell a story that is the story of privilege and the white American experience so that white Americans can hear things that they need to hear. And not, so I had a real issue of like doing stories where I felt like the readership or the listenership was largely white. Um, the people in them were not, and it wasn't moving the needle. Like I didn't hear people really, I heard them listening and reading and saying, I pat myself on the back. I've done all the work, but actually they weren't doing the work in their daily lives. They weren't putting themselves into those spaces. They were putting their kids into those integrated spaces. It was all just kind of like theoretical. And so my reporting over time has changed as to how I approach marginalized communities. Um, but, uh, but I just, I, I cannot pull myself away from trying to understand me as a white American, trying to understand our country and trying to figure out how do we possibly level the playing field? when it's just so, it's been so unlevel for so long. So hopefully that answers some questions. <laughs> yeah, and you touched on a lot and some of those stories are heavy issues and a lot to unpack. So when you were writing those, um, how do you uh, approach any backlash you might face and how do you go through that whole process? And um, Ken, if you want to start by answering that. So how do you balance that when you um, receive any backlash? And that question is from Joe. I, I think that's hard for all of us because your your instinct or maybe your first impulse is to be defensive. You're, you're kind of in this defensive crouch. And I, I think that sometimes doesn't serve us well um, because, you know, sometimes people will will raise really valid concerns about our work and we, we need to listen to them at the same time there's a lot of trolls right and <laughs> it's not worth that's not worth our time and i i think it takes a while to re to to be able to distinguish the two you know mm -hmm. meaningful constructive criticism from people just trying to push your buttons and I, I, I tend to, to try to take a deep breath. You know, when, let's, let's say you get an email that's challenging you. Um, if it's using a whole bunch of uh, blue language and expletives, I tend to just shut it out. I, I, I don't have time for that. None, none of mm -hmm. us do, you know, and why should we go through the emotionally draining experience of letting somebody just call us awful names? But if it's something where it's actually raising valid points, I take a deep breath. I try not to to just dismiss it out of hand, and I think about it. And then I, I might, if usually I'm writing with other reporters on stories, so we'll talk about it together, and we'll figure out if this is something you know we should learn from or that we could have done differently. And you you always involve your editor, if, especially if there's an if there's a challenge to anything in terms of fairness or accuracy, you always involve your editor. You don't want them to be surprised, you know, by something. Um, so, you know, for me, it, it, it's, I say that, but I can't guarantee you that the next time I write a story and, and somebody, you know, challenges it, that my impulse still won't be, oh, what do they know? You know, I just mm -hmm. spent a year on this. What do they know? <laughs> uh, you you, you kind of have to try to hit that mute button on that and and do the best you can to hear what they're saying. Easier said than done. Yeah, and I would say the best way to hit the mute button is to do the work, to do the reporting, to know you are right. They may yell at you and you, then then sometimes I'll go back to my notes. I'll be like, no, no, no. I, no, we have this from three different people. I have a document to this. I have like, don't gaslight me with this email. Like I know that we did our job and we did our due diligence. And so I actually, when I'm reporting and, you know, I think Ken feels the same way. I mean, we spent so many days fact checking this thing. We were so fixated on accuracy. And that is all part of when people come at you, you know, the story is sound. It is good. We are good. Like quibble with me about certain things, but I know that, you know, at the end of the day, I did my job and I did it well. Um, and yes, I've had corrections before. 
Um, they suck. <laughs> you learn from them. You figure out protocols that you put in place to not have that happen again. Um, they are inevitable, although I will say with the luxury of time that we are so lucky to have, they become less and less. Because if you really, you know, you have the time, you're not like having an editor being like, we need it now, it's going on in five minutes. Like, you know, um, what I'll also say about, um, I'm not on Twitter very much. <laughs> That's one thing. Um, and also, you know, I have, a, there was one story that I did. I, I, I haven't gotten that much backlash. I think in this story, we got like one email that was like, you're disgusting. And I was like, thank you, fine. Go back to your hidey hole. Um, but, uh, but I did a story that was kind of the precursor to um, my second season of, of, of the podcast that I did about school desegregation and school resegregation. And, um, and it was really interesting because I did a very short feature on this, one of the schools that, that I end up writing about, uh, which was the, it was this public school in this diverse neighborhood and it, it had become the whitest school in the whole city. Um, and it should not have been based on the neighborhood demographics. And when I did that story, um, the, the headline of it was uh, that uh, an East Nashville school kind of quietly resegregates. I have never gotten more hate mail, more than from the angry white parents who were so mad at me calling them racist and that they were not racist. And this is like in 2018. So this is like pre kind of, I don't know what we're in 2.0, you know, after George Floyd, kind of the reckoning that we're maybe having. Uh, but, um, and it was like, I had so many of those yelling at me. And I remember sitting at my desk and just being like, no, no. Like, I am not calling you racist. Using the word resegregation is not racist. Like, no. I refuse to back down. Like, you can get mad at this headline all you want. And you know what I did? I just was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep pushing this. I'm gonna keep doing this. Like, it gave me a fire because I was like, they clearly are not ready yet. Like, how do I tell them? Like, so then I go do like an eight part series. I did not get, I got one email. It shows you either how much they, like people's minds changed. I mean, it came out after George Floyd how they knew they couldn't say, maybe they still felt the same way, but they were not sending the emails, which was so interesting. So like this one five minute feature elicited more rage than like a multi-part national podcast. And that was kind of interesting because I, I did feel like, wow, maybe some progress has been made. And so all that to say, like so, so much of the hate mail that you get is a projection from the people doing it, right? It's really all about themselves. And so you do have to remember that like, it's not you, it's them. <laughs> like you can delete that and be okay with it. Sometimes it warrants a response, but a lot of times you're just, you might be just like kind of poking the bear. You know, I try to be very nice and cordial. And then if they try to re-engage, I just don't respond. But, uh, but that was like an interesting experience. Yeah. To have kind of a, a part A and a part B to this. Um, and uh, people acted very differently the second time around. Yeah, I like that you both kind of touched on like the challenges of covering such a big story um, and like the importance of like fact checking and making sure all of your information is accurate um, in case other people challenge that. But I also know like in this story that you covered, there was like so much information from your public records request and like hours of audio and like video footage. Um, so what did you find difficult or like how did you decide what to put in your story and like what to leave out? Um, and this question's from Lyle and T. Well, the story started at 13,000 words and ended at 10,000. So that was, we had to cut stuff. All of our darlings. No. How do we do it, Ken? <laughs> or you needed. Sorry about that. I, I think that's a situation where you, once you come up with the story structure, it, it, enforces discipline in terms of what you use and what you don't. Because if your structure is set up where you're going to highlight key points or themes or scenes, then you use what's needed for each of those. And what doesn't fit goes. 
by the side. I, I, I can't tell you how many folders, documents, uh, pieces of audio and video we had and didn't use. And that happens with every story. And it's, it's one reason I'm, I'm a fan of outlining early on, trying to come up with a structure, because I think that helps you decide what you most need and what you're missing and what you can do without, <clears throat> because it's so easy to get distracted and go down side roads and lose yourself for weeks or months at a time on something that really doesn't serve the story. And, you know, and a lot of times what we think about too is not just the start of the story, but the end of the story. If you know what the end of the story is, you know what you are writing towards and you know what you're reporting towards. And that also enforces a certain kind of discipline where, you know, okay, I'm starting here, I'm ending here. Now I need to report and write to get me from there to there. That really helps because otherwise you're just wandering, you're just drifting. And that's a very common thing in, in large scale projects. So for me, it, it really thinks, it really helps to think about the story's architecture early on so that you, you really have a plan on, on what you're doing. Yeah, I wholly agree with that. I mean, I'm a big outliner and I'm a, I'm, I, uh, I also usually try to, because you're asked so many times, what is the story about? I usually try to write like a two sentence, what is this story about? And that, and I can refine that as I go, but I usually write like what my first question was when I started the story. And then I work on kind of a two sentence, like what is the story about? And those are like my North stars. So you're constantly remembering like, this is what this story is about. This is the question I'm asking. Am I answering that question? Am I setting it up to be a story about this? Yes, I found many other interesting things along the way. They will not make it, but like what, you know, you just have to have such discipline. And and uh, and being a narrative, you know, someone who's who really loves narrative as Ken does too, I do think a big part of, of knowing what you want in a story is thinking about what's the, what's the structure going to be what is the story going to be like I like to emulate a lot of things like I'm you know I'm just like oh yeah like the ending of that movie I just love that scene can I do that scene like or that book of all those short stories like could I do a thing that's nonfiction like that like I'm pretty my mom's a fiction writer my dad was a documentary filmmaker and so I just like pull from all mediums and I just have I'm agnostic, like good story is a good story. And like, I'll try to recreate it. So like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big copycat in certain ways. Cause I'm like, I'll read a book or I'll see, you know, a, a new series like this, this series that I'm working on that comes the podcast that I'm working on with the New York times, like a big part of it, even though like, it won't really feel like that, but like, I was like obsessed with better call Saul the whole time I was like reporting and writing this. I'm like, I love that show. I love like the hapless lawyer. And I'm like, I felt like there was a kinch. So I just, I, I was just like, I'm going to watch, I'm going to rewatch the whole thing. Like, I don't know. I just, I'm constantly thinking about story and about the vehicle for that story and about um, how I can pull inspiration from other mediums. And that also helps me because I think, Oh, if I could just make a scene like that, like, how do I do that? So um, I like to be creative in like how I approach stuff and, and that helps me know what I need and what, like what I want you know, to get, so. You talked about um, being creative when you're writing your story and just really getting inspiration from different outlets. Do you have any tips for a journalist on how to really find a good story? Oh, that's such a good question. I feel like that is like the thing that they need to teach you in journalism school that I did not get or like that they don't they're just like here's how you write a story here's how you report a story but like how do you find a story how do you find a story I don't know Ken if you have an answer for that. I mean I don't I think some of it is like just uh just like leaning into life <laughs> you know like 
not falling for the tropes, not falling for the kind of like, it has to be in a neat and tidy bow, just like being okay with like messiness and stuff. And like being like, but in that messiness, like there's something I feel like, uh, you know, you're nosing it out. And like, and, um, and I do think part of uh, knowing what a good story is, is understanding the elements the you know, the building blocks of a story. And, um, and also just like reading really wild, widely watching wild, widely, like, there's so many good TV shows right now. There's so many amazing books, there's so many great podcasts, like, I just am a voracious consumer of stories. And I think that's actually been the best thing I can do is just to like constantly read and search for stories so then when I find my own I'm like oh that kind of reminds me of that other one I don't know like or like I see elements of stuff that I really like like characters or like complicated like messy situations and I'm like yeah yeah that 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 I want to find something like that you know so I think it is just kind of like iron sharpening iron with your consumption habits how do you find a good story? <laughs> yeah, you know, it, 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 uh, reading widely is huge. And Maribel mentioned early on about with this story, you know, that she was introduced to it and she couldn't let it go. You know, she kept keeping tabs on it. I think a lot of times if you're obsessing over something, that's an indication that that's a story you want to pursue. For me, sometimes it's just pure obstinance. I, I find that sometimes if I read about something or if I learn about something, where information is being withheld from me and the public that we're entitled to know, just as a matter of principle, I pursue it. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, when I was at the Seattle Times, I read a column you know, about a lawsuit that had been filed against the University of Washington, which is a public university. The lawsuit had been settled and the column said the terms of the settlement were confidential. Well, I'm sorry, if you were a public agency as a defendant, the terms are not confidential. They are public because it's the taxpayers who are paying it. And it's a public agency that is beholden to whatever the terms of the settlement are. So just out of pure obstinance, I filed a public records request, not only for the terms of the settlement, but I said, well, so while we're at it, give me everything. You know, if you think that the terms of the settlement are confidential, I want everything you have. So I filed one of these omnibus public records requests, just, you know, kind of being you know, not, not petty, but it's just like, it, it upsets me. <laughs> it really upsets me when people try to take something, uh, <laughs> make it confidential when it shouldn't be. And out of that one public records request, we wound up doing a series and a book. So that just being upset at a line in a column led to a book. I think that often is the case where you just see something where you're either curious or you're you you realize that agencies are doing something that they shouldn't be doing, or you just run across something that you can't let go. One of the other things I do is I keep a, um, a call later file. A lot of times I'll read about a story in the paper or I'll hear about a story somewhere, and there's somebody's story within it who is not being interviewed, somebody who has been hurt, who has caused harm, and the trauma is too fresh, the story's too fresh, and they're not going to talk now. And what I do is I just make a note in the calendar and say, I'm going to call them in six months or in two years and see if they're willing to talk now. And that's what happened with Unbelievable. Um, Marie, the young woman who was um, raped in that case and was not believed, who was charged, she had never spoken to the media. And I, I just wondered if as time passed, she might think differently and be willing to talk about it when the, the <clears throat> trauma wasn't as fresh and when she wasn't being besieged with reporters. And instead she's approached by a reporter years later who is not pressuring her. It's just simply saying, I, if you're available and if you'd be willing to talk about this, you know, here's who I am, who, here's who I'm working for. And um, would really like to hear about your experience here. And you know that call later file pays off because a lot of times reporters move on, right? A story happens, we cover it, we cover it in mass, and then we move on. A lot of times if you come back in afterwards, you can get the better story when people are ready to talk to you about it and when there are more documents available. Yep, 
I feel like I've always been like I'm a terrible like breaking news reporter because I'm always going like the other direction or like my nut graph is like buried in my story, you know. <laughs> um, but like I do think that there is something to be said for like just kind of turning things on their head and like thinking about something differently. That's been like a huge asset for me is just like thinking well, here's the center of the story, but what if I like went over here, you know, what's someone that nobody's talking to. And that served me really well as a young reporter, kind of doing smaller features, um, just like going off the beaten path and kind of, you know, finding someone in the weeds. Um, and then also, I think the thing that I, I loved about working with Ken and, 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 and kind of the folks that I consider to be like my mentors um, who have been doing this a lot longer than I have is like the thing I feel like they always like when they find a story that I love and I want to harness is like, it's like equal parts, like curiosity, like wonder and whimsy and like a total chip on their shoulder. And it's like somehow they like combine all those things and like, and then that the story feels like it feels important, but it doesn't feel angry. It feels fresh. It feels like, um, but still like, like, has some bit of levity oftentimes in it but it's like and like it just you know they come to all of their stories with such a with such a I mean they could be jaded like Ken could be jaded he could but he's still like so curious and he still like finds a good story and he gets so excited and he like like loves I mean you have to kind of love the human heart and the human condition and be interested and curious about the human heart and I think like when you let that like drive you, like really good stories can come. Like, but you have to kind of have equal parts, you know? Um, thank you. Yeah, I think we, um, there's just a few minutes left in the meeting. So I think we can ask one more question and feel free to add in any final thoughts that you have. Um, but I just had a question on like kind of the effects of your work in the long run. Um, do you think that like receiving such like prestigious awards like the Pulitzer Prize and the Peabody Award like gave your stories more like attention and did you ever imagine your work would like be recognized on this scale and kind of like what do you hope for the future of your journalism careers? I don't know that the awards bring attention to the work. Um, that that usually comes after. And and I'm not saying this just to say it, but th that's really, um, you know, the, the impact is much more rewarding um, than, you know, any awards that you receive. Um, you know, like, like with um, Unbelievable, that story, that was rewarding because it helped you know, people who either read the story or listened to the radio show or read the book or watched the series on Netflix, it helped them get a better understanding of trauma and how we are all subject to um, false assumptions. We, we, you know, a lot of us think we know how people who have been hurt should act, right? And, and in thinking that, we can, we can go in the wrong direction and, and we can doubt someone because of the way that they're acting. It doesn't conform to our expectations. And seeing that story told <clears throat> in all these different media and reaching different audiences in different ways was really rewarding. You know, that to me was something that I think that's what we want as journalists. And, you know, the, the best day I've had as a journalist is is when the governor in Illinois, you know, Hannah, you had mentioned it, you know, when he declared a moratorium in executions and said he wasn't going to sign any more death warrants. Um, we learned about that late on a Saturday night. That's the best day I've ever had, you know, knowing that your work can have that kind of impact. Um, so yeah, yeah, that that's that's really what you kind of hope for. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree. Um, the awards are nice because it gives you capital to tell these stories. My biggest fear as a young journalist was knowing that I wanted to tell big stories, but why would anyone let me? And they're not cheap to do. 
they do not pay the bills. Like it's not, you know, so when I win an award, I think, okay, maybe I've got a couple more years doing this. Like maybe my editors won't like put the kibosh on these really in crazy long projects that um, cost much more and I'm never on the radio. Um, so there's that, like, that's what I, I, I care about when I get an award. But I will say like, um, what's been most rewarding for me is that um, I love being a local reporter. And I love seeing the work that I do change my community, you know, like my, my series about the school, that school that was under enrolled and failing and on the chopping block now has a waiting list. Every parent that never gave at the time of day before they want to get their kids in there. And I hope they're doing it mindfully. I hope they've, li they've listened and now they're like, I want to be a part of the solution. So, and that school this year was one of the top performing schools in the state. When I, when I started covering it, it was on the bottom. That like could make me cry. Like when the principal calls me and tells me like, we have a waiting list, like this is crazy. I'm like, that's, my, that's what I want to happen. Like I want, I want to do work that accumulates and makes progress one decision at a time with each individual person making a different decision about their life. Like, yes, sure, heads can roll, scalps, whatever. But like, I want everybody to feel like in their own life that they know that they can make a decision that's going to improve their community. With the story that we did with the judge, like, she is no longer the judge. That was huge. Like, she retired and someone new came in. And the whole system, like there is now an oversight board that will oversee the detention center. So maybe this won't happen again. And I love that because like, I live here. Like this will benefit my child. It will benefit my neighbors. And that's what, that's my child knocking on the door right now. That's what I want. Like that, the, the like I love being a local reporter. I love it. And it just makes all of these things so important to me because the, this is my neighborhood. This is my community. Thank you guys so much for sharing your vast knowledge on um, <laughs> these topics and really giving us advice, tips, and just great insight. So I'm going to send it to Dave um, Hafer. He is the O'Brien Fellowship Director, and he will be ending the meeting for us. Thank you again. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, this has been truly, truly inspiring. I mean, from the bottom of our hearts, Ken and Maribel, this is your integrity, your high standards, your passion. Uh, this couldn't have been more instructive for us. So thank you on behalf of the college and the fellowship. I want to also thank our fabulous moderator, Skylar and Hannah, uh, multimedia manager, Callie Hostad, uh, her interns, Laura Barrett and Sierra Jones, uh, everybody's done a, a great job. This has been so, so helpful. So thanks to our audience for being here. I uh, hope everybody benefits and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us, everyone. And thank you for the fabulous questions. Yes, thank thank you. you.